thanks for the invitation first and to sort of give a talk here just ran in from the airport so uh, if this is a little incoherent yeah so please forgive me <laughs> All right, so my talk is sort of circulating around various uh, topics yeah, so that deal with non adiabaticity in rubric atom systems, rubric molecules, and uh, sort of some other applications. Uh, all right, so I'm going to skip this. And so we basically want to first look at uh, interesting effects in uh, rubric atom molecules, uh, among the many things. Atom. So, first thing I'm going to talk about is a long range rubric atom ion molecules. And uh, so, uh, so there's roughly three classes of rubric atom molecules. Uh, so, there is uh, one kind where a ground state atom is embedded in the rubric atom. And you get binding to low energy electron scattering. So then there are multipolar, uh, there are molecules that are formed by two rubric atoms that interact via multipolar interactions. And then, uh, so the latest one is the rubric atom ion molecule. And so that's what I'm going to spend some time on. Uh, so the idea is pretty simple. So if you look at the generic start map, so we have these uh, intersections between uh, the p state atoms mostly uh, and the hydrogenic manifold. And do we have a laser pointer? Yes, um, okay. So at the same time. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay, so right there, so there's a, a minimum. Yeah? So if you essentially have an electric field so that uh, has a 3D minimum at that location, uh, you can in principle form a trap system. So uh, Oh, bye bye. Picture isn't showing up. Huh? So that must be uh, okay. It's I made it on a on a PC. So, so that'd be why it's a Windows Mac conversion. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. So you, uh, yeah, would be a rubric atom sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so an ion essentially. So and the rubric atom is trapped at a in the nuclear separation of uppercase R between the center of the rubric atom and the location of the ion. And so the question is, yes, so is this a uh, stable system? And uh, so to answer that, so one has to do this multipolar calculation. And so there is, uh, so the cartoons are missing. Okay, actually half the figures. And so how is that? Please, have we got it as a PDF? Yeah. So if you say it's a PDF presumption that, then the figures will all be in it. Just... So this is uh, not. Well, it's not here. I think it's not going to be possible. Yeah. So yeah. The, kind of. Oh, yeah, okay. So some of the figures are there. <laughs> okay. All right. So then. Uh, so this is the uh, interaction Hamiltonian and so between uh, so the ion uh, and the rubric atom. It is a multipolar interaction where one of the two multipoles is simply a monopole. And so the ion has no internal structure for uh, the purposes here. And so what's quantized is the electron coordinate and the spin of the rubric atom. And so the internuclear separation is a, a semi classical variable. All right, so these pictures are fortunately there. So, uh, so if you just look at the first two terms, there's the L equals one. So that's essentially the homogeneous part of the electric field of the ion. So that's the dominant effect. So the L equals two part is a quadrupole term. Yeah, so that's the next higher multipole and so on. And so what one can do then is essentially so diagonalize this uh, Hamiltonian in a, a large enough basis and get the adiabatic potentials of the system. What one finds is, yeah, so there are some uh, effects due to higher uh, multiple order orders, but essentially, so these uh, trapping minima survive, even if you go to very high 
multifold order. So actually they get a little deeper. And so this bond yeah, so between uh, the rubric atom and the ion actually exists. So we've done some study. So what's the effect of the uh, cutoff of the multipole order? L equals one is homogeneous electric field. L equals two is very effective because the quadrupole coupling uh, couples the two fine structure components of the P line. So this is uh, connected yeah, so by the L equals two term. And so you see there's a strong level propulsion yeah, so between these two levels as so compared to the L equals one only case. Uh, so, and then there's some additional effects that come from the chain mixing. Yeah, so there is uh, yeah, substantial chain mixing and also L mixing. And so the L mixing allows us essentially to, uh, in principle, excite these uh, rubric atom ion molecules from P states as well. So there's enough S and T character mixed into these uh, molecules that we can excite them from pretty much any lower state. So in this paper that we wrote about that, so there's also some proposals how this could be done experimentally. So in short, so the only thing that you need is you need a device that gives cold enough ions. So uh, you need to have a photoionization laser that's close enough to the photoionization threshold that the ions are low enough in energy. And so then you need a uh, excitation scheme to populate the rubric level in the vicinity of the ions. So the idea is to see the sample of ions and then excite rubric atoms in the field of these um, ions. Um, so we've looked into the vibrational spectra so of these uh, rubric atom ion molecules. Uh, so they are harmonic at the bottom. Then if you go higher up, uh, so you see so that there are substantial unharmonicity. So here you see the dispersion series for the energy levels. So there's, uh, for this example, so I've calculated the alpha one and alpha two dispersion coefficients of the level series. And so whenever you have something like that, as one can think about interesting wave packet experiments. So there is uh, classical dephasing, yeah, so that depends on uh, if you excite a wave packet of, of these levels, uh, you can get classical dephasing uh, and uh, there's also a revival. So the revival is dominated by uh, so the alpha one term. And so this is all pretty well known. So the revival time is just one over uh, so the dispersion, the first order dispersion coefficient of the vibrational series. Uh, so what makes uh, some probe experiments uh, quite uh, feasible in this case is first, uh, so these energy splittings are uh, so compatible with laser spectroscopy. So this is a very comfortable range. And also, yes, yeah, so on the inside and on the outside of these uh, potential wells, uh, so the internal state of the of the rubric atom is very different. So on the outside, it's mostly P character. On the inside, it's high mm -hmm. angular momentum character. So you get some differential response yeah, so of, of the molecule uh, to drive fields on the inside and on the outside. And so that can be uh, used for pump probe experiments. Uh, so, uh, so they were actually rough. So just after we published our paper, there was another one coming out essentially on the same topic. So these uh, papers are essentially uh, written at the same time. Uh, and uh, so I also want to note, yeah, so many of the predictions, yeah, so they've been verified in Tillman Faust group at the University of Stuttgart. And uh, so next I'm going to talk about the lifetime. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, there's radiative decay, but so the big question is, yeah, so is there a substantial non-adiabatic decay? So we've analyzed this by solving the uh, time dependent shooting equation in the von Huang representation. So it's, uh, I, we believe it's good enough uh, to look at just three uh, adiabatic potential surfaces. And so the one that has the uh, molecules in them, and then two levels that are adiabatically non-adiabatically coupled through which the system can decay. Uh, I'll spare you the equations. And uh, so essentially, we solve that. And then in order to measure the lifetime, we essentially measure the flux uh, of the wave function into a set of absorbing balls. So on the inside and on the outside, we have absorbing balls and the population drops. And uh, so from the population drop, you can back out 
the lifetime. And uh, so here's the result. So uh, I'm plotting on the x axis the vibrational state and on the y axis uh, the principal quantum number. So this is for medium, this particular one. And uh, so the color scale is the lifetime in seconds. And you see, so generally, so these rubricatum ion molecules are very stable against non adiabatic decay. This is the exception of uh, high enough vibrational quantum numbers. And so they are, so these yellow crosses essentially mean you are getting into a regime where the non adiabatic decay competes with uh, natural decay. So that's up here. Uh, we also found, yes, on the side that Landau signal predictions are a little bit too optimistic. And uh, we also see this funny checkerboard pattern. And that smells like numerical mistake. Okay, so, but it's not. Okay, so if you look into the details, you see that. So, this checkerboard pattern is actually due to a quantum interference effect. So, essentially, so the wave function decays from here uh, onto the, yeah, so the, uh, dissociating potentials, but there are some inner wells, and you basically get uh, delay line loops. And so, we are part of the wave function basically forms something like an atom cavity. And uh, so, that has a resonance structure, and so that basically generates these checkerboard patterns that we have observed. Uh, all right, so then uh, that got us so this whole topic. And so, um, how good is the Landau signal approximation in order to make predictions about the lifetime of such molecules uh, got us to basically solve the, the two-level problem. So exactly. So we have uh, two levels uh, so that intersect. And uh, so essentially, we want to study this uh, non-adiabatic decay process and compare it with the classical Landau signal model. So here are the equations and so we have the kinetic term and then two uh, at two diabetic potentials with opposite slope and the fixed coupling so that can be scaled so that it looks nicer and then uh, so from here uh, we can transform it into the born huang picture so this uh, the, the usual first order and second order non-adiabatic corrections and uh, so here we found uh, that uh, I want to just uh, point out the most important thing. So uh, the time-dependent shooting equation allows us to compute the lifetimes with this flux method. So this is extremely accurate, and it's particularly accurate yeah, so in the Born Huang picture. So we are uh, coupling terms are weak. Uh, so then we also do uh, bright Wigner lifetimes. They very they agree with these. Uh, Fermi's golden rule lifetimes are pretty close. So you see that. Uh, so the red triangles and the blue symbols are pretty close to each other. So whereas the lambda signal predictions are uh, not, not particularly good and so for the low lying states. And so if you think about that a little bit, and that actually makes a lot of sense. So here I'm listing all the things so that are uh, not true. Yeah? So the lambda signal picture is a semi classical model, as you can. Think of it as a drag atom model. And so you're basically pulling uh, so the quantum particle uh, at a fixed speed uh, through an anti crossing. And so, and so these are the assumptions that are usually made. And uh, so they are simply not satisfied uh, so for the lowest lying states. Uh, and so, what I want to say is uh, so this uh, system uh, so is actually pretty common. Uh, so it's in cold atom trapping and BEC trapping. Atom interferometry, so it's a very general class of topics. Yes, so they are. So this kind of study matters. All right. So, uh, so that's a quick summary on the first part of the talk. Yes, so we predicted ripper atom ion molecules, computed lifetimes. Uh, we thought about how good the Landau Cena model is. Yes, so it's not particularly good. Yes, so for the lowest lying states. Uh, we observed an interesting quantum reflection effect yeah, so on inside potentials. And uh, so we've looked at, so this is a yeah, classical problem as yeah, so of two intersecting levels with fixed slopes uh, from a fully quantized point of view. All right, so then, uh, so uh, in the remaining minutes, yeah, so I'll also 
uh, talk a little bit about uh, so VRLs in physics and so are there interesting uh, non-adiabatic effects. So here we are also interested in atom interferometry. So and uh, so that's a collaboration with the ARL. And it's also funded by NASA. And so here we want to implement a new form of atom interferometry, so that we call tractor atom interferometry. And uh, so, uh, so we, so there's various things uh, so that uh, make atom interferometry sometimes fun. So with our tractor atom interferometry, we are addressing these three uh, points. So uh, atom interferometers can fail to close. Uh, track the atom interferometry fixes this. It has a high dynamic range and uh, it also suppresses wave packet dispersion. And just to visualize this, uh, so I hope these cartoons work. So, uh, so these black lines are uh, the ideal atom interferometry trap check tools in the instrument frame. A good case is this. So, we want all that this is happening. Okay, so that the atom splits and then recombines exactly at one space time point. Uh, what if there's a differential vertical force and you can't get that? So it fails to close and you don't get a signal. It can have longitudinal gradients. And so then uh, they get out of sync time wise. And again, yeah, so the interferometer does close. And so this is the apocalypse. Okay, so if you have this, so then. Yeah, so we are really dead. <laughs> okay, so uh, all right. So what we uh, want to do is this. So we have three D confining tractor potentials that essentially shuttle the wave packet components uh, through the through the interferometer, and it's guaranteed to close. Uh, so if you do your tractor programming right, and uh, so that solves the three issues that I mentioned uh, a couple of slides before. And so we have a quantum model for this. So it looks very generic. Okay, so we have a kinetic term, uh, lattice potentials, and coupling terms. So, and from that, there you can see. So there are some uh, clearly so some non adiabatic slash diabetic uh, issues. Yeah, so, in this uh, scheme, uh, so we wrote three papers on this. Yeah, so, uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, so, uh, so here, uh, I don't want to go through this in detail. Okay, so uh, we focus on a scalar tractor atom interferometry and the uh, atom interferometry. So we have one deep well at the beginning. So and it's actually a superposition of two wells, and initially they are superimposed, and then uh, through tractor controls, essentially you split them in two, and then let the two wells just go go their individual paths, and then. Uh, recombine it and uh, so there's some uh, sensitive point so that's right around there so they are uh, the two uh, valves are about to split the potential gets very soft and so that's where we are worried about non-adiabatic effects so at the time when the potential is soft it's prone also to non-adiabatic excitations and uh, so this is a good case as if you run the interferometer slow enough. Uh, stop this halfway through, so after the interesting part is over. Okay, so I'm very adiabatic. All right, so in this uh, adiabatic limit, so the theory works very well. Yeah, so I also want to say, the tractor atom interferometer uses the same uh, Feynman pass integral formalism than any other atom interferometer. So this uh, all works just fine. Uh, and uh, so, however, uh, so if we do the separation too fast, uh, so it becomes non adiabatic. And uh, so I just show a movie so that visualizes this. Uh, And from clear, so this is not working. Okay, so if you do the splitting too fast, uh, you get non adiabatic excitations at the time instant when the valves are about to separate because the potential is very soft at that time. And uh, so, what we do in order to fix this problem, yeah, so we have uh, gotten the help from uh, Vlad Malinowski, so from ARL. 
So he's a specialist in quantum control. So we use quantum control uh, and optimal control methods in order to do fast uh, adiabatic beam splitters. And so very roughly, so you can sort of think of this as shaking the, so you instead of very slowly separating the valves, you sort of shake the wave packet in such a way so that uh, it's both fast and uh, yeah, so it's still adiabatic. So we verified that with this particular scheme here, we only have a 2% in contrast loss of the interferometer. Uh, so this is uh, an instance where uh, mixed adiabatic, non-adiabatic uh, dynamics is interesting in atom interferometry. Uh, so then uh, last one, um, this is a uh, rapid, rapid adiabatic passage of uh, cold Rydberg atoms optically shuttled through quantized RF fields. And so the motivation here is to do a dark matter search. And uh, so in short, yeah, so there's this, uh, there's of course many candidates for dark matter. And so one candidate is axion dark matter and axion dark matter converts into gamma particles, yeah, so in strong magnetic fields. Right, so the idea then simply is yeah, so to have this happen in a high Q cavity, so energies are predicted to range, yeah, so in the gigahertz to terahertz range. So that's just a sweet range for rubric atoms. Okay, so one has to look at this stuff as rubric atoms just because we have this natural frequency match. And so this, we have this axion dark matter, dark matter should exist, and we are rubric atoms are sensitive. So at the end of the day, then, uh, so one has to find a good way to pull a single photon out of a cavity. Okay, so the whole thing turns into a cavity QED experiment. So, and the objective is pull single photons out of the cavity. And so you do this with uh, basically having circular rubric atoms on an optical conveyor belt and to a rapid adiabatic passage uh, utilizing quasi static electric and magnetic tuning fields. And uh, so here are the equations for this. And so similar to what, I, what I've shown before. The difference here now is that we have two spin states, the lower and the upper rubric state. And uh, so a Rabi coupling, here it was N. And it's the photon number in the field. And so here we just want to pull one photon out. So n is equal to one. And uh, so all of this happens essentially on the presence of an optical lattice. So uh, optical lattice is moving and so through the cavity mode. And so for the cavity mode, uh, we use a sign square model function, yeah, so something like that. And uh, so then the two optical lattices are kind of swept through each other. So using the electric and magnetic quasi-static tuning figures, right? So this is a little hard to see here, okay? But you have these uh, moving optical lattices and as the atom basically goes through the cavity, uh, the two lattices are swept through each other. And so the whole thing then turns into an interesting adiabatic slash non-adiabatic problem. And uh, so there's two cases and so we can uh, to go for uh, this positive sweep or a negative sweep. And uh, so we find that the negative sweeps are generally good and the positive sweeps are generally bad. So it's not symmetric. Okay. So I was a little surprised at this at first. So uh, the, the, the results are highly asymmetric. So you have to essentially do it such that the atoms are initially in the lower stress state and then uh, so as the atoms go through the cavity, uh, the atoms are swept through the other adiabatic potential from the bottom up. And uh, so I want to uh, probably skip this. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of detailed studies we did here. So what we look at is uh, so how non adiabatic the system is. Okay, so this is non adiabatic. And so uh, the, the, the wave function essentially goes all over the place through the optical lattice. This is not a good case. Uh, this is a good case. So the one wave function essentially gets projected very nicely from the lower optical lattice into the upper optical lattice. Uh, and uh, the, this case would be kind of workable. Yeah, so we have some spread uh, dispersion of the wave packets through the optical lattice, but at least it doesn't go very far out, so this would still be detectable. Uh, 
All right. So, and then, uh, so we, I made these uh, performance maps. And so what we look at is, so uh, what's the trend, what's the transition probability? So that's the biggest requirement. We want to detect a single photon with a hundred percent probability. Okay. So that's uh, the predominant requirement. So what's red in this picture is good. And the parameters here are the RF coupling and the depth of the optical lattice. You see the RF coupling isn't very high as it's only a couple of kilohertz. So that's well within the regime what one can do in a high cube cavity. Um, all right, so then uh, the other thing is the tunneling probability. So in here, blue is good. Blue means no tunneling. Uh, now, that's one really interesting thing. That's entirely anti-asymmetric. Okay, so if you do landau Cena est estimates, yes, would be entirely symmetric. But in reality, so it's uh, very asymmetric. And uh, so we see that, as I already said, positive sweeps are bad, negative sweeps are good. And so the negative sweeps are actually agreeing quite well with the landau Cena model. All right, so uh, that's my summary on the dark matter detection. So I just want to point out, so the method is, yeah, so basically to have a rapid adiabatic passage of Rupert atoms on a optical lattice. And so we've identified a good operating regimes as to uh, so what direction one has to do these adiabatic sweeps. And uh, yeah, so that's also uh, interesting as a to, to look at and so how this relates to the van der Siener model. All right, so now I have just three quick slides left. And uh, so uh, Jim, yeah, so just described a lot of details about, yeah, so yeah, field sensing. So what I've talked about in the last 30 minutes, so I was basically a universal talk, but so we also have this company, so called Rupert Technologies. And so they are yeah, doing this uh, field sensing stuff. And uh, so that's the basic method that was already introduced. So I'll just skip that. So uh, what we are doing there is uh, so we use the superhead method, yeah, so basically to go to to measure low electric fields. The superhead method is basically a, a, like in a classical radio, so it's a, a heterodyne detection method. Uh, so this was a measurement at 10 gigahertz, and uh, so we had electric field of the RF on the X axis and the measured response is of the electromagnetic field sensor on the Y axis. And so we see a nice linear regime. And so that's about 80 dB wide in power. And then, uh, so the noise limit is essentially set mostly by technical noise. Uh, what I also want to say is, so you see we are getting pretty low fields here. And so we use a frequency comp laser. So in order to block all the EIT lasers. And so that really made a difference. Okay, so having all these lasers locked to a comp, yeah, so this uh, sub kilohertz stability. And uh, so that's uh, one line of work that we are doing out of many. Yeah, so another one is, uh, so if you think about these Rupert radios and Rupert field sensors, uh, at the end of the day, nobody is going to buy this stuff if we don't compare it to classical radios and characterize it. Yeah, so like engineers characterize their electromagnetic sensing equipment. Okay, so and uh, so what one has to look at, yeah, so what is to be viable at the yeah? end? So one has to look at uh, so harmonics, yeah, so in the response, yeah, so we don't want to have too much high harmonics. And you also don't want to have uh, intermodulation distortion. So we are, here we have two signals and uh, the one at O. Uh, the IF is, uh, yeah, so you see the numbers here. Uh, so we have a frequency difference of kilohertz in this sample. Uh, so that's basically two IF. And uh, if we have weak signal fields, then uh, so the, the Rupert superhead basically gives a Nice linear response. Okay, so you should have uh, two peaks. Okay, so that's uh, the ideal life. Okay, so you put in uh, two frequencies uh, and you get two frequencies out. Uh, however, this has been checked uh, minus 60 PDI. So on the signal side, you see all these intermodulation products, so all the mixing products, and uh, yeah, so harmonic content. So we are looking at this yeah, so in uh, pretty uh, great detail. 
I'm not going to show any results. I just want to give you a flavor for what's going on there. Uh, also, yeah, so we, uh, we have this thing. Yeah, so if you want to buy one, okay, you can talk to the company. <laughs> so uh, so this is the first low swap atomic receiver. So we call it the ARCs. And so for you rack, that's uh, about 30 kilograms and 200 watts peak. And it has a long service cable. I think our first one is 20 meters service cable. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and what else? Okay, so all the lasers are in this. Okay, there's no extra box. Okay, so this is what uh, what you basically put on the table, and then there's a power cord, right? So no other stuff needed. And it's uh, yeah, here are some initial demonstrations so that uh, we can actually do uh, detection. And so this model is focused on lower frequencies. Yeah? So there's not just interest in high frequencies. A lot of people are interested in HF and UHF. So that's why we are looking at that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, the company is hiring and my group is hiring too. All right, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gerrit, for this nice talk on all of these different topics. So there's time for some questions. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the things you wait for the lifetime. Do you want to get a couple in the first part of the month? Yes, to see changes to the lines themselves as you expect them. Changes to the lines. Are you mean level shifts? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so the, the second order coupling, so the P alpha alpha yeah, shift. So, so the diagonal part of the second order coupling. Yeah, so I'd like to see the, the effect of the non radiative electricity. Is that easier to do by the So that's a very good question. Yeah, so it depends on your laser resolution. So I think if you have, let's say you have crappy lasers, so like a, a megahertz or two. So then the lifetime effect is probably easier to see. So whereas if you have kilohertz line with lasers, so then the level shifts are probably easier to see. So you see, so the scaling is, and so, um, so talking kind of megahertz is a sort of typical binding or typical vibrational frequency. And so the P alpha alpha effect as is on the order of a few percent of this. So if you have a laser line that's in the range of, let's say, 10 kilohertz or less, I would look for that first. And then, of course, yeah, so you, you cannot, I should say that too, you cannot just turn the B alpha alpha off. So that makes it a, maybe a little hard, okay? So you don't have a comparison because you cannot just turn it off. So with the lifetimes, uh, at least, yeah, so you can sift through this map as a fraction of principal quantum number and vibration of quantum number and see whether or not that's a resemblance with this theory. So uh, what makes me believe and so that we didn't make a substantial mistake anywhere is so in the for high vibration of quantum numbers it converges to the Landau Sina limit. So that's a good test. So if you go to high vibration states and so you start satisfying the conditions for the Landau Sina approximation and you want to see convergence. So that's a must. And at, at low energies, yeah, so uh, yeah, so it's also clear that it has to deviate from the Landau signal theory. And, uh, so I think uh, we'll analyze that. Uh, you see, yeah, so just to give you a number, uh, so the, the Landau signal model, yeah, so for the lowest lying states, could be maybe a factor of 10 or 20. Or it's not, not thousands of, uh, not 20 orders of magnitude. So you have to be careful how you define the, the reference energy for the Landau Sina model. But if you pick the best possible case, it's only about a factor of 24. Maybe just can I on the same topic? So mm -hmm. is it possible to bind an electron by the same mechanism? And maybe more interestingly, a positron, so that you can make a positron bound state up the avoid course. So an electron has a you know, of course much higher vibrational energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we have hundreds of bound states. Yeah, so with an electron, you might be hard pressed, yeah, so we get only one or two. <laughs> but but if you go to low enough N, yeah, so probably, yeah, so uh, I think probably can. Yeah, so you'd have to push the lower N, I think. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? 
long service game. Uh, sorry, long service game. A long service cable. Okay, so the service cable is so essentially what connects this uh, big box. Uh, let's see. Ah, look how nice an arbor is. Okay, so that's a bit of a teaser. Uh, all right, so this is, uh, yeah, so on this picture, so we only put a stub antenna on. So, but the first customer yeah. so wanted a service cable that's 20 meters long. So, and uh, so it's, uh, so what's in it? Okay, so everyone's guess. Okay, so at the end, there has to be a, a vapor cell, of course. And so you hold it up in the air. Okay, so that's your radio receiver. And uh, so it's uh, mounted on a stick. Yeah, so if you go to the company website, you see some early versions of this. Okay, so it's on a, a plastic rod. Yeah, so and on the back end, yeah, so it's about half an inch thick. So with some mechanical protection. And so uh, I think we put a, a Kevlar vest around it. Okay, so it's just that it's not so easy to break. And uh, yeah, so and there's optical fibers in it, and so it's uh, so you have to get the light in and out somehow. Yeah. And uh, so our uh, so it's single ended, okay. So the if you go to the company website, and so you see a model, yeah. So we are so there's the service cable, and then so there's a plastic rod, and so that contains the vapor cell. And on, on the top side, it shines green, okay, because that was with cesium, yeah, so there's green light, and the green light looks nice, okay, so it comes through the plastic a little bit. And uh, so it's reflecting, okay, so the service cable is one sided, yeah, so that's uh, also that's a, a lot of various types of cellular architectures around, okay, so there's a lot of cells, yeah, so there you have left and right coupling. And then, yeah, so there's also ones we are. So the service cable is just connected to one side of the cell. Maybe there's one last so on your interferometry part. I mean, the, you mentioned about trajectories not closed. Mm -hmm. But there's a view, I mean, it's the classical trajectories don't close. I mean, still the wave packets can interfere. So you're, this is more in a context of absolute. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually, so the, the wave packet, it's very easy to lose your wave packets. So because, yeah, so they have a, 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 yeah, of course, right. Yeah, so if you give it enough time to disperse, yeah, so eventually you saw the tail ends will yeah. overlap. Uh, so at the very least, you get a, a visibility loss. Right? Yeah, sure. So, but, uh, so if you, uh, of course, a lot of this is done with cold atoms, right, and PPCs. Mm -hmm. So the other dispersion is so slow, yeah, so that it can actually, that it can actually fail to close. And so, for instance, yeah, just to give an example, as on the space station, they do all this atom and interferometry stuff. And so they are, so they have the big problem yeah, so that the space station is rotating. So it's a real issue. Yeah, so that uh, it can happen yeah, so that your wave packets just don't find each other. Right. So it's also, yeah, it's good. Uh, okay. I, I said that yeah, so that. Uh, So these black lines, so these are not in the inertial frame. Okay, so the black lines are your ideal trajectories in the instrument frame. Right. And if this just veers off, okay, so then uh, it can happen, yeah, so that your base packets just don't meet again. And so the, the lower right case, yeah, so in guided wave atom in the ferrometry, so where you have confinement in two directions and free motion in one direction. Uh, yeah, of course, everyone wants to do this with reasonably cold atoms. Yeah, so the atoms would be moving at, let's say, a meter per second, mm -hmm. something from that range. And yeah, you can very easily imagine, yeah, so that so if uh, your platform yeah, so starts to accelerate, your wave, your atoms simply never come out of the guy. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's the apocalypse. Of things. Mm -hmm. It just turn around in the guy. And so we are asked, yeah, so if you have this shuttle based pulling them through, um, yes, it's always, if it's not working, it's because the programmer made a mistake. That's what the tractor trajectory is. So one question I get a lot is, yeah, so do the tractor potentials interfere? Or do they wash out uh, in the ferrometric signal, right? So if you have less or noise, so, that, uh, yeah, so one has to do this common mode. Yeah, so this will affect the controls as far as possible. 
You also look a lot at space applications. Yeah, so where the potentials are not very deep in the first place. Right. Yeah. Okay, so maybe just before we, so now we come to the coffee break. So the, I'll just say two things. So here, we, this room will have some people in it and because we're inside these barriers, everything should be reasonably safe. And the barriers still make some problems. So if you can just show your badge, if you do go out, uh, it's possible to walk through the barriers out to the street without any card. But if you come back in, if you can just show the security guy or if there's someone around from the content, just your badge, that will just help to make this, this easy. And the coffee is then, if you go out the door, you have to go through this funny loop around to where you came in and then turn left and go to the end of the building. And the coffee is at the, in this room, the night home room uh, at the end of the building. So maybe we thank you all for my time and then we'll be back at, at 10 to and time. How do we turn this off?